Thank you for joining us for today's AIA accredited webinar, MAP006B, Grouting for Success. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via an email after. And you can always send questions to MaPay Digital at MaPay.com. As I mentioned, this is an AIA accredited webinar. So if you have not signed up for the credit and would like to, please send your contact information to us at that same email address, MaPay Digital at MaPay.com. And we'll be happy to get that ball rolling for you. Now, without any further delays, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rick Lindsay. Rick is an architectural sales representative for MaPay Corporation. He's based in Derry, New Hampshire, and his territory includes Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and upstate New York. He started with MaPay in 2012 as a technical representative, reviewing products and specific applications for successful installations. In August of 2019, he joined the architectural team, working with architects to select and specify the best product and installation methods for their projects. Rick has worked in the flooring industry for 34 years, starting in sales for a masonry and tile supplier in New Hampshire. He then went on to work in distribution as a sales manager throughout New England before joining MaPay. His interests include spending time with his children, boating, exotic and muscle cars, sports, and family time at the lake. And he also knows a thing or two about grout, which he'll share with us now. With that, I welcome him to the microphone. Rick, the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you, Jen. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Grouting for Success, Ordinary to Extraordinary. We appreciate you taking the time and the busy schedule. Should be a pretty good program um, going through the details and hopefully breaking down um, any questions you might have or looking into any questions you might have for specific installations. So our objectives today, we're gonna to talk about the history of grout, why it is used and what grout is supposed to do. Understand how specifying the job site mix, factory blended, Performance cement grout can make a difference in your owner's expectations. What's an industrial epoxy grout? What's the difference in an industrial versus a standard epoxy grout? Understand how many different types of grout can assist you in specifying proper performance on your next project. Again, just breaking down the different categories, cementitious to epoxy to resin ready to use grouts. Why would I use one over the other? That's what we're gonna talk about today and hopefully get a good understanding of which product to use and what application. The history of grout, originally considered one of the world's seven wonders, this particular um, picture or installation uh, goes back to the fifth century, decorated with lions, bulls, and dragons with a strong glazed blue as a background. You'll notice in some of these pictures, a lot of blue is used back in the day. The history of ceramic tile begins with the oldest of civilizations. It is known that the Egyptians as early as the fourth millennium used brick, brick tiles to decorate their houses of course, with grout as well. This beautiful medieval tile in Winchester Cathedral goes back to uh, the century, and it's just one of those beautiful existing products that's been around forever, and it just gives you an example of the right installation, um, the beauty of a, a product and the longevity of a product um, when looking at this particular installation. Some of these are just... Uh, just amazing. Again, the Moorish mosaic from the ninth century, another product, uh, another um, example of a great installation or just some beautiful tiles that were used. You know, the history of ceramic tile and the beauty of ceramic tile goes back for decades, um, for centuries. And, you know, I think about the, um, the historic mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. You've ever visited those, one in particular, you have the breakers, which has a 40 foot ceiling 
with three quarter inch mosaics on that ceiling. Now these were not in sheets back in the day. So you think of the workmanship and laying those three quarter inch over your head on the ceiling, um, just amazing craftsmanship. But you get a lot of these beautiful examples of these installations um, over some of these, uh, these past installations of uh, the history of ceramic tile and where it came from and, and where it started, where it really originated. But that's always a good example and uh, some amazing products. So grunt has been used, you know, since the beginning of time. Basically, initially it was gray and white. Eventually they added pigments, oxides as a base color, mixed on site by the installer. Early cement grout at high absorption, you know, up to 35%. I mean, you can imagine the variables of on-site mixing um, with these pigments and oxides. Um, you know, and the other thing to keep in mind on this particular slide is this 35% absorption. Very, very high back in the day. And it's probably why they had just the gray and white, um, less uh, cost of failure. As recent as 2017, this particular mosaic, 2,200 years old, was discovered in the ancient city located in today's Turkey. Just an amazing discovery. I mean, look at that beauty in the installation. <clears throat> so why do we use grout in these type of applications or installations? To keep the water out, to protect the tile edges, the tile expands and contracts. Grout joints also allow for slight irregularity in the substrate and tile. Key word is slight. Grout is not there to, um, you know, true up the tile to um, change any imperfections or create any, uh, um, it's, it's there to fill the joints. You know, I get a question on a regular basis, which grout do you have that is waterproof? Well, it's a simple answer. We do not have a waterproof grout. Yes, we have several grouts that, obviously several selections, different grouts that are more dense, that are less resist, or a higher resistant to water or moisture. Um, however, grout is not waterproof. And it's not there to, again, be in a, uh, for the, um, the tile itself. It's there to fill the joints and keep out water, again, protect the tile edges. However, um, it is not a waterproofer and it does not true up the substrate or take the uh, irregularities in the, uh, in the tile. So different types of grout we're gonna talk about. Job site mix for sand and cement, standard Portland cement grout, and they put, you know, we, we added additives to enhance the performance of the standard Portland cement grout, which made it denser, made it stronger, just a better all around performance of a standard cement grout. Then you get into a high performance cement grout, calcium aluminate. So it's not a Portland cement, cement based. We're going to talk about a lot of the advantages in using a calcium aluminate grout, um, high hydrated cement versus a Portland cement grout, a modified emulsion. Epoxy, a chemically resistant epoxy, premixed ready to use grout, very, very popular. I'm sure you all know these days it comes up quite a bit, a lot of advantages. Again, we're going to dig into that and, and talk a little bit more about it. Um, and your workhorse, the industrial grade epoxy. Um, again, we'll get into detail, talk about using that in the back of the kitchen of these, uh, you know, commercial applications in these restaurants. So the um, ANSI standards for the cement-based grout, 118.6 is the standard Portland cement, 118.7 is your high performance, calcium aluminate, high hydrated cement, and 108.10 is the installation of the grout, that process. Now ISO standards, you know, ANSI are very, very important. However, when you get into the ISO standards, that really breaks down the product itself. It, it gets so specific or very specific so it lays out, you know, what actually am I going to be specifying, giving you the additional examples, or the additional categories being an improved, a fast setting, high abrasion resistance. Again, it's, I can't say enough about the ISO standards as far as getting the product specified onto the job site. Very, very critical in a specification. So the standard cement grout, it's Portland-based. It has pigments or dyes, highly porous, susceptible to staining and contaminants. 
Consistency in color can be an issue due to sensitivity in water, both mixing and in the cleanup process. What are your options? Your options are sanded or basically two, sanded or unsanded. Sanded is one eighth or greater, the most common grout. High, high absorption up to 10%, may scratch sensitive finishes like glass and stone. So like with any grout, um, especially these days with the beautiful glass and the uh, stone tiles that we have, if there's any concern at all, do a small mock-up so you're assured that when the uh, product gets on the job site, we don't have any issues. So any question, do a mock-up just to make sure um, which grout will, uh, will be the best and that we're not gonna have any scratching on the tile itself. The unsanded grout goes from a 16th up to an eighth. Primarily used for wall tile, glass, or stone tiles. High absorption up to 18%. A lot of times it's matched to stone tile to get the slab type look. In other words, not focusing on the tile. If you had this white or gray tile and you put in a charcoal grout, a darker grout, it's going to accentuate the grout itself versus uh, these are generally used. You have a tight joint. You want to focus on the tile and the beauty of the stone and the glass, um, not necessarily the grout joint. So what are the pros? Very cost competitive. Suitable for most applications except when chemical resistance is needed. The cons, it's cement, it's soft, it's powdery, it should be sealed, inconsistent in color, and possible efflorescence. So I'm sure we've all seen these pictures, uh, specifically that top one where, you know, you've used uh, cementitious 118.6 cement grout. The installer comes back at the end of the day, does that one or two extra passes with a wet sponge. That charcoal grout looks beautiful at the end of the day. Come back the next morning and it's inconsistent. Charcoal is either silver or like we see here, kind of blotchy. What's happening there is the water is pulling the pigment out of the grout and it's basically drowning it out. It's, uh, it, it's pulling it out, it's becoming inconsistent um, because we, are, we do have pigments within the makeup of the product. So again, minimal water, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but water is not its friend. Cementitious products, specifically standard Portland cement grout, water is not its friend. We'll talk about we'll talk about epoxy a little bit later, and that is completely the opposite. So I'm sure we've all seen this. And uh, the other thing you can get is an efflorescence. Efflorescence is when a water is getting into the grout or behind the grout and pulling the minerals from the Portland cement-based grout to the surface and you have that white film going down, you know, we see it most, mostly occurring in a, uh, or a lot of times it's prevalent on a side of a building. You see that white film coming down a brick building or something, that's the uh, efflorescence. Now, there are cleaners available. However, depending on the surface of the tile, depending on the type of tile, it could be difficult to clean. And the other factor is, unless you find the mode of failure where this water is coming from, it's gonna continue to happen. So those are generally the two factors in grout and why they're inconsistent. Um, there are other factors, however, you know, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, if you use too much water in the mix itself, there's an issue or there could be a, con a concern. However, it's generally in the cleanup or the process of water being behind the actual uh, substrate or behind the grout that causes an issue. So what are your options in the 118.6? Um, polymer modified, you have a dry polymer or a liquid polymer. Benefits of a polymer modification, in other words, adding a polymer to the mix, color brilliance, improved color retention, lower absorption, improved tensile, flexural, and compressive strength. It just makes it an all around better mix. Uh, again, making it denser, makes it, making it more flexible, uh, less susceptible to staining. And you have two types. You have a dry polymer, which is generally factory blended, and it comes in the bag itself and you mix with water. Or you have a liquid polymer, which is a lot of times used in lieu of water. Um, so a couple different types. Again, they're both very effective. Um, <clears throat> this type of grout, although it's not absolutely required, it's definitely recommended to have a sealer, um, especially in a high traffic application or installation. 118.7, this is your high performance cement grout, calcium aluminate mixed with fine aggregates. A lot of advantages to this product. It's faster setting, 
efflorescence free because again, it's not a Portland based cement product. Lower porosity, I mean, we talked initially way back in time, 35% absorption, then we went to 18% porosity, 10% for the standard 118.6, and now we're talking a lower porosity than 5%. Uh, makes a, a huge difference in an installation. So obviously with that, you're going to get better color consistency and resistance to staining. Advantages, less shrinkage and water absorption can be submerged in 72 hours. Higher compressive strength, pencil and flexural. Universal formula. So you can have one grout on the job site. You don't need to get a sanded or unsanded. One sixteenth up to one inch. So one product on the grout will hand, uh, excuse me on the job site will handle all the grout uh, for that project makes it very easy very universal again test the surface prior to grouting especially with all these new products these beautiful like I mentioned stones and glass tiles out there let's make sure that we're not going to have an issue we're not going to get any scratching um, with this product do a mock-up we say it can be submerged in 72 hours. Um, I was at this uh, job site a few years back where we had a pool in a condominium, a multi-million dollar condominium project in New York City. And obviously the tenants are paying to use their pool. What we had is we had a, a couple tiles that came apart in the bottom of the pool. So obviously the downtime was a concern. So what is uh, the possibility for that application and the best um, App, you know, best installation for that application is using a fat setting mortar, which means you can come back and grout it in three hours. And then within 72 hours, using this 118.7 calcium aluminate, high performance, high hydrated cement, you can, it can be submerged within 72 hours. So again, in that particular installation, that was the best product to use. So again, it, when I say that particular installation, you know, a lot of times we think the epoxy is the best product to use, the, you know, highly chemical resistant or the uh, industrial grade epoxy. Epoxies are very, very good. However, it's doing the research. It's knowing which product to be, should be used in this application. What's best to be submerged in a short amount of time? Obviously, the, the epoxy is not the best in this installation. However, the 118.7 is not going to be the best in the back of a kitchen. So, again, do your research. Call the manufacturer, check the technical data sheet, just to know exactly which product to use in the installation that you're up against. So we compare the cement-based grout, the basic 118.6, that's just the sand and cement, then the polymer modified. So adding the polymer to the basic Portland cement grout is a better. And the high performance, again, we've talked, uh, you know, giving a lot of examples of why you would use the 118.7 grout um, fast setting, really hydrated, just a great product all the way around. So this is a good, better, best. And what are these are based on? They're based on absorption of the grout, consistency of color, and the technical performance. Here's the ISO standard, a very good example of how it's broken down. You know, if you specify a C2 improved, FAW, you know, fast setting, high abrasion resistant, reduced water absorption, you go to the job site and, you know, a lot of manufacturers have their particular ISO standards on the bag. You happen to visit a job site and say, you know, I specified the C2 FAW. However, on the bag, it says a C1 standard. You know there's something wrong here. So again, like I mentioned before, it's about having the product you specified on the job site. And ISO standards really help getting to that point or really ensure that that happened. Well, I can't say ensure, obviously, things have changed, things can change, but it really helps um, with the process and you know, hopefully getting the product is specified on the job. ISO standards, I uh, can't say enough about them. Ready to use the urethane grouts, I mean, urethane <clears throat> acrylic grouts. These are very, very popular these days. Um, you know, Generally can be, well, we'll get to the, uh, the pros and cons in a minute. Um, this grout may contain various types of water-based water -based polymers, acrylics, or urethanes. It can be used in a commercial application. Um, water exposed to water or submergible ap applications are, you know, really comes down to the manufacturer. Um, follow the technical data sheet 
uh, but in most commercial applications, it can be used. There are no standards for this particular grout as of yet. However, um, it is becoming very popular and it is the standards are in the works. Again, standards are in the works. They're going to be based on compressive strength, not ingredients. Um, again, working on the standard through MMSA, and that will be um, considered by the ANSI committee for inclusion. So what are the pros, the pros, the pros of the uh, ready-to-use grout? No mixing. Container can be resealed after use. Silica sand, dust free. We know the silica has been an issue specifically uh, last four or five years. It's come up quite a bit. So um, big advantage there. Flexible, great crack resistance, 1 16th to a half an inch. So again, have one, one product on the job site. No efflorescence because it's not a Portland cement based product. Color consistent, no color fading, no steeler needed. This is an example of a iridescent 3D um, translucent product. This is a premix product that comes um, in a one or two gallon unit. And again, this is not going to be used in every installation or every application. However, when you have focus points um, in your installation, let's say if we walked into a hotel lobby behind the desk that you're checking in, you wanted to highlight that area, have some focus points. Um, it's pretty amazing what you can do with this type of grout and the effects you get uh, from the different tiles, depending on the tile that is used. But just another option of the uh, designs that are out there. Ready, back to the, uh, again, that is a ready to use grout as well. Um, the cons on these products, 24 hours, it's a slow cure. So 24 hours on light traffic, 72 hours on heavy traffic, seven days for cleaning, limited water resistant, limited use exteriors, slow cure times and low temperatures and moist environments. Now we state higher cost. Yes, it's a higher cost initially. However, if you take in consideration the labor cost on mixing bag to bag, letting the, letting the grout slake prior to installation, um, you're gonna save it on the labor. So again, it's initial cost, a little bit higher, but you know, total package and the total installation is probably gonna be a lower cost. So just keep that in mind that uh, that's not necessarily a factor versus a, uh, a cementitious grout that you're gonna mix. Another customizable grout. Um, these are products that can be matched to really any paint manufacturer's palette. Um, it's used to blend into a tile. Let's say if you had a national account that you wanted to match their logo, maybe a university that wanted to match their particular colors. A lot of, of advantages here, a lot of options, color options uh, available with this particular grout. How it generally works is you'll get a swatch of the color you're looking for, send it to the manufacturer, they'll take a look at it, make a sample, send back the sample for approval, and then hopefully move forward with the project. And most, most manufacturers require a minimal as far as uh, the amount you need to uh, to purchase. However, for the installation or to match a specific color and, and get exactly what you're looking for, this might be a nice option on a particular project. Get into epoxy grouts, a um, few different types. Get the 118.8, which is an emulsion mortar and grout. 118.3, which is the chemical resistant Again, tile setting and grouting epoxy. And the 108.6, which is the installation of these products. The ISO standard is just 13007, which is just labeled as a reaction resin grout. 118.8, this was primarily used prior to adding latex, latexes to a Portland cement mortar. In other words, you would have a plywood subfloor. Um, I want to bond to that directly with my tile. What am I going to use for an adhesive? 
We know that cementitious products will not bond to Portland, uh, excuse me, bond to plywood without a latex. So we have to go to an epoxy um, that would be the adhesive at that time or that mortar at that time. Um, so once we started getting the latex added admixtures for the Portland cement mortars, then that kind of went away. It's not as popular these days. Um, and not all manufacturers have a, a 118 material as a grout. They still have it just as a mortar. But keep in mind, these are not 100% solid epoxies. So they are limited as far as where you're going to use them. However, it's a very, very good grout, very dense. It isn't, a, you know, being an epoxy, it's under that category. So um, very, very solid product to use. 118.3, this is your chemically resistant epoxy. It's essentially a 100% solid system. Generally has an epoxy resin, a hardener, and a powder that contains an aggregate. It can be supplied in two or more parts. It's a thermal set. After mixing, but before curing, it can be emulsified by water. So a few points here. It can be supplied in two or more parts. You have to mix the whole units at one time. I've been to different jobs where you've had some job site chemists trying to make a half bucket or mix a half bucket, and frankly, the installation has not been successful. You have to mix the whole unit, put it together, and it's that that brings me to my next point. It's a thermal set. So once you mix it, get it out of the bucket, place it on the floor in small piles, or if you're working on the wall, get a craft paper or something to set it on. And the point is get it out of the bucket so it's not heating up within the bucket. And never put the cover back on the bucket because again, that's just gonna heat it up and it's, you wanna be able to touch the bucket. But it's very, very important to mix it fully, scrape the sides of the containers, mix exactly what, it's, what it states, um, full units, and then get it out of the bucket and put it onto the floor. So a little more about the 118.3, early formulas were very difficult to use. It had few colors to choose from, sometimes used in residential applications for stain resistance, used on commercial and industrial applications where chemical resistance was needed, highly resistant to chemicals and staining. Back in the day when I first started in this industry, I worked in a masonry and tile supplier and we used to sell epoxy grout. On Saturday mornings, we would put together these two by two boards, um, two foot by two foot boards, and we would grout them with epoxy. And, you know, we'd have a big audience that love to see the epoxy. We really uh, drove home that water was its friend. You really can't use too much water in the cleanup of an epoxy grout. Uh, what you don't want to do is get it into joints that haven't been grouted. However, initially, unlike a Portland cement or a cement based product, you can use a lot of water in the cleanup and it's not going to be an issue, again, other than getting into the joints um, that haven't been grouted. Uh, at that time, that particular supplier was the number one seller of quart units of epoxy in the country. So my point in saying this is the early, earlier formers that were, had a few colors, that changed. There were a lot of colors available to choose from. They weren't difficult to use, providing you knew how to install them and you knew what you were doing and you get on it right afterwards. In other words, clean up right away, uh, start the cleanup process. Cause we all know when you come back the next day and it's epoxy haze on there, it's a little more difficult. I'm sure there are some cleaners that work very well these days. However, let's get it done initially, easy to clean, uh, different than, than cementitious obviously, but um, it, there's a lot of advantages to epoxy grout. And my point was that uh, a lot more colors available and it's not as easy, it's not as difficult, much easier to clean these days than what it used to be. 118.3, the newer formulas came more user-friendly, like I mentioned, more colors came, became available and decorative colors came out, glitter to, glow, glitter to glow in the dark. Again, you could do a lot with this epoxy. So they really, branched out from your basic standard epoxy with uh, minimal colors, a um, lot of advantages in the performance and also the appearance of this particular grout over the years. So where do you use these grouts? Commercial kitchens, milking barns and dairies, dog kennels, public restaurants. Again, commercial applications, um, chem they're chemically resistant, 
so they can withstand a little bit more than let's say a 118.6 cementitious grout. So these are the applications that they're primarily being used and good examples of the application that, uh, that would fit very well for these products. The pros, no steel are needed. They're less costly in maintenance, excellent chemical resistant. They're good for walls and floors, very color consistent, excellent stain resistant, good workability and water cleanability, again, initially. And most manufacturers have a mortar and a grout. If you want an epoxy mortar, uh, most manufacturers have them available. Obviously, uh, the grout's very prevalent in, in the marketplace. The cons, again, they're usually two or three part, must be mixed precisely. Cleanup can be more challenging than the other types of grout. Yeah, not necessarily more difficult, just more challenging. If your installer uses a cementitious grout on a regular basis and then comes to use an epoxy, sometimes they're hesitant. However, it's not much, it's not more difficult, it's just completely different in some cases. In other words, water is its friend, that's one of them. And it's a little bit stiffer to, to put into the joints. But I wouldn't say it's more difficult. Um, the key word here is challenging, depending what you're used to. So that leads me to epoxy favors experienced installers. Working time, again, that thermal set um, could change things a little bit, could minimize the work, working time. And some installers, if they walk into a room with a particular epoxy is being in, in, installed, um, they could have some sensitivities. They could, you know, some of them start to break out initially from walking in the room. So that is definitely a concern. More expensive? Well, more expensive up front. However, what's the uh, expectations of the job site? You know, the longevity of this product is going to, you know, a lot of times um, withstand a lot more than the the alternative to a 118.3. So again, more expensive, yes, initially, but uh, what's the life expectancy? What's the uh, the turnaround of this particular product? Generally, like are you replacing the grout on a regular basis of it because it's a cementitious? So we have to look at all aspects. Again, it goes back to doing the research and and knowing what product is the best for the particular installation. So I sell standard for uh, <clears throat> the epoxy grouts, just the RG, again, higher performance characteristics and improved cementitious grouts, pretty basic. So now we get into the workhorse, the industrial epoxy grout, um, 118.3 and 118.5. Now this is standard epoxy was susceptible to deterioration from the new enzymatic no rinse cleaners. Those cleaners that when, um, you know, these cooking oils that, that have oleic acid in them, get with this no rinse cleaners along with the meats from the, uh, from the cooking process, get onto this floor, that's when you start getting deterioration of these joints. And even if you use a standard epoxy, it's not gonna hold up under these conditions. You have to use an industrial epoxy grout. These cleaners can be a real concern. Uh, have, you know, we, we talk about it all the time. We run into it quite a bit. Well, I used an epoxy, but was it an industrial grade epoxy? No. I mean, it, it's a, definitely a concern. The new industrial grade formulas were developed to cope with harsher chemical environments. Their test is the ASTM C267. And she has a list of chemicals showing the grout's degree of resistance. So take a look at the technical data sheet. Manufacturers will label or, or, or spell out exactly which product uh, they were tested with, uh, what particular um, chemicals were they tested against, you know, and, and it'll give you the, uh, the results of what's there. So you know, yes, this is going to work in the particular application I have. And most industrial grade epoxies compared to furon epoxies and physical strength and chemical resistance. However, they're much easier to clean and install. If you talk to furon, you talk furon grouts to some of the installers back in the day, they wouldn't even touch the project because they were very, very difficult to spread onto the tile and very, very difficult to clean. So these have come, even though they're industrial grade, they're the best epoxy for these conditions. They're not as difficult to clean. Uh, they're not as difficult to install. A lot of the manufacturers will have a little packet added to um, the cleaning process. You add to your water to make the cleaning process that much easier. But again, 
hate to keep saying this, but water is its friend and um, it can be cleaned. You just need to get on the epoxy and uh, start the process as quickly as possible. So epoxy, good, better, and best. Good is the ready to use premixed grouts. Again, in the right application, it may be superior. Better, chemically resistant, 118.3. The best, 118.3 industrial grade. Again, the best in this category based on cleanability, chemical resistance, and technical performance. But it's not always the best in every installation. Remember the pool that I talked about. So it's again, um, just doing your research. Movement joints, very big part of a, a tile installation. A um, few different changes over, over the years. You know, basically um, prior to 2011, the maximum was 36 feet in both directions. 2011, it came to 20 to 25, and now it's 25 feet in both directions. Interior, 12 feet exterior, and you can see how it's changed over the years. Now, when you get into alternative requirements, alternative requirements, a good example of that would be, let's say, a car dealership, where you have a showroom window that goes floor to ceiling. So it gets very warm midday. In the evening, it cools down. So you get that additional, it could get that additional movement of the tile because of the direct sunlight and then the cooler temperatures in the evening. When that's the case, you have to make sure you handle it as an exterior application or an exterior installation. So that would be maximum 12 feet in both directions. Very, very important. Um, other examples of where you should use movement joints. We'll go to the next one. We'll look at the EJ171, where this is the TCNA guidelines. Uh, EJ171 is just very helpful in laying out where you want a movement joint, where you should have a movement joint, the specifics. Um, it has about eight or 10 pages in the TCNA. And in addition to your standard guidelines, it has different uh, matrix on how to break down your particular installation. So it, it gives you calculations on how to figure, um, well, this might not be specifically under that category, so what do I do? Um, but again, very, very helpful. So where should you use movement joints in general in a, in a floor application? Around the perimeter, that has to be a soft joint. Any columns you have within the installation have to be a soft joint. Any partition, anything that's solid that's not gonna move, we need to make sure we have a soft joint. And how is that designed or how is that uh, prepared? You see in the picture here, they're using that foam rope. That's called ethafoam or backer rod. That's basically to take up the space of the joint and you, you come back with a particular sealant. That sealant has to be a uh, class 25 sealant. The shore hardness is, a, is, it is reduced from 35 to 25. So you ask, what is, exactly does that mean? The point in that is, you don't want a joint or a caulking that goes in there that is too hard because obviously it defeats the purpose. If it's too soft, then if you walk across with a high heel, then it could penetrate the joint. So that's why they have these designations on a particular type of sealer that needs to be used or sealant that needs to be used because of those changes um, and because of those concerns. And again, you get the 25% elongation and compression. All these things are a huge factor in making sure you have the right product. Obviously, you want to make sure you get a commercially rated, um, you know, something that's going to hold up with a lot of traffic in addition to holding up within the joint. Again, the elongation and compression. So that's why we have these particular requirements and they have to be followed. But again, I can't say enough about the TCNA handbook uh, version of the EJ171. Um, very, very helpful, very specific, and will really help in making sure that you have a successful installation. And a couple other things, if you're going onto the wall, you're going along a wall and you come to a, uh, let's say at the uh, you know, back of a kitchen, doing a tile, tiles on the wall, and you come across a, 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 a oven that's in the wall, you wanna make sure that's a soft joint, soft joint, because that's not moving. So expansion joints or movement joints are very important on a vertical application as well. The other one that I see all the time that you know you don't have enough movement joints or you don't have any movement joints are pools. 
any change of plane in a pool should have a movement joint around the perimeter. All these specifics that make a huge difference in an installation. So again, the best, best uh, handbook to refer to is the PCNA EJ171. It will really give you some helpful tips or helpful information on specific applications or installation of movement joints. So in summary, all grout is not created equal. Let's specify the grout based on the area of use, type of tile, and expectations on the job site. There are some very harsh cleaning chemicals or materials being used to maintain floors and commercial kitchens that are detrimental to the tile grout. The new generation of industrial grade epoxy is the only solution. Again, you can't use a standard epoxy. It's going to be better than maybe a 118.6 cementitious grout. However, under these chemicals, it's not going to hold up. It's eventually going to deteriorate. The life and performance of your project depends on attention to proper selection of grout. Movement joints are critical to every tile installation, every tile installation. Even in, let's say you had a mall where they had skylights. I've run into this where you have a skylight beating down, 100,000 square feet. There are five areas that the tile is lifting. It was underneath these skylights where you have direct sunlight. Same type of thing. You're getting that movement, which is not happening in the other areas because it heats up during the day, it warms down in the evening. So another example of make sure you know your installation, know what you're up against, um, pick out the best grout for the job. Again, that pool versus a, a, a industrial grade epoxy. Industrial grade epoxy is not gonna be the best in a pool area if you want a fast setting. You have a good, you need a quick turnaround time. However, the 118.7 is not gonna be the best in a, uh, in the back of a kitchen where you need this high chemical resistance with these no rinse cleaners. So again, said it a few times, do your research, talk to the manufacturer, read the technical data sheet, um, and this is going to tell you a really narrow down, hopefully pinpoint the product you need to use for a successful installation. I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Hopefully it was beneficial. and. Um, Again, thanks again for joining the, uh, the presentation. And uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, the first one, why aren't the additives mixed in the original grout product if it has so many benefits? Not sure which uh, well, grout. <laughs> I mean, the original products just had the sand and cement and were mixed with water. Then we came out with the polymers or the latexes that were mixed either at the factory or in a liquid form after the fact. So that was, I guess, progression of a cementitious grout to add all the value that we talked about with these particular products. So again, initially they weren't available. Um, and then they just kept getting better and better, adding the powders at the factory or adding the liquids after the fact. Yeah, kind of the technology evolved, right? Exactly. Yep, yep. Here's a good one. Are there any concerns with using epoxy on an exterior application? It's a great question. Um, when epoxy grout is used as a grout on an exterior installation, things you could run into is color variations. Um, this may occur over time, especially with lighter shades due to ultra, ultraviolet rays, or even just general environmental conditions. So again, you have to be a, a little concerned about the epoxy or an exterior application. It'll hold up, it's gonna you know, be, it's, it's basically bulletproof. However, as far as the color variations, um, there could be some concerns over time. And that's why we say specifically, if you're using it as a grout, where if you were using it as a mortar, there really would be no concerns. Makes good sense. Um, okay, here's another. Should all cement-based grouts be sealed? Cement, cementation is 118.6. Um, although a sealer is not required, it's highly recommended. I would say yes for that particular grout. Calcium aluminate, the 118.7, not necessary. Um, however, 118.6, I would always seal that product, especially in a, uh, in a commercial application or um, in a high traffic area. 
good advice. Okay. Um, right, waiting for some more questions to come in here. Um, can the ready to use or premixed grouts be submerged? You know, even the uh, superior ready to use grouts should not be submerged. They can be used in intermittent wet conditions, for instance, a shower wall or floor, but the performance, the makeup of the product is, is really not to be used in a submerged application. All right, well, um, giving people a bit more time just to type in. Any other questions? Um, all right, if there aren't any other questions or if you think of any other questions after the webinar concludes, you can always again send them to us at Mape Digital, mape.com, and uh, we'll be sure to forward them to Rick. Uh, and we Definitely, we invite you to visit our website's technical library and our video library as well, because we have uh, just a, a wealth of information about a grout from selecting to applying, uh, and that can all be found at mapay.com. Uh, if there aren't any more questions at this moment, I guess this concludes today's webinar. And uh, we thank you very much for uh, spending time with us today. We know that uh, you have very busy schedules and uh, we appreciate the fact that you decided to spend some time with us. And uh, Rick, thank you again for a really great presentation. And um, we'll see you all next time. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>